Rudy Giuliani flips the script on Robert Mueller, accusing him of collusion and claims the investigation will soon blow up in the special counsel's face. But will that new strong arm tactic actually work? As you know, the former New York City mayor has been one of the president's fiercest attack dogs. And according to Axios.com, Giuliani says there are two questions that are totally off limits. If Bob Mueller wants to interview the president first, why Trump fired FBI Director James Comey? That's a no-no. And second, what Trump said to Comey about Trump's former national security advisor, Michael Flynn. According to legal experts, it's unlikely the Mueller team will agree to those terms. But last night on Hannity, Rudy Giuliani said it doesn't matter because the whole investigation is illegitimate. So there. The real story here is not that this case isn't going to fizzle. It's going to blow up on them. The real question is what we talked about before. There's a lot more to what they did that nobody knows about yet. I a know some more, of it. A lot more to the obstruction of justice, mm -hmm. to the collusion, to the fake dossier. Oh, I know to a Trying lot. to bring Steele back in after he was completely discredited. And then feed it to Mueller. Yeah. And uh, Mueller is going to have a lot to answer for. Mr. Mayor. I, I said a long time ago, th the investigation here has to be in the investigators. That's right. Giuliani is going to investigate the investigators. How you like me now, Bob? So is this new offensive strategy a good one, or is it opening up the president to more legal problems? Joining me now, attorney and author of the case against impeaching Trump, the legendary Alan Dershowitz. Welcome back to the show, sir. Thank you. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about this. This is obviously a different tack that the, uh, the Trump legal team is taking. Do you think it's a good one? Well, I have my questions and doubts about it. I don't want to see anybody criminally prosecuted. I don't think that the Mueller people should be prosecuted for obstruction of justice. I don't want to see the law of obstruction of justice expanded. Mm. I started to come into this issue and to write my book against the impeachment of Trump because I believe that if they had gone after Hillary Clinton in the same way, I would have written the same book and made the same arguments. I'm against weaponizing the criminal justice system, the impeachment system, against anybody, whether they're Democrats, Republicans, prosecutors, or defense attorneys. And I think when you call for the prosecution of other people, you essentially strengthen the case for prosecution of your own clients. So I think Rudy Giuliani is doing a great job with the strategy that he selected for how to deal with Mueller. That is, to make him an offer he can't accept. That <laughs> is, an offer that becomes, to paraphrase, the godfather. Mm -hmm. And then he can clearly announce, and the president can announce, look, I wanted to speak, but Mueller turned down the offer. It's he who's being unreasonable. I think that's a brilliant strategy. But to start talking about prosecuting other people and how other people obstruct the justice, mm -hmm. it just is not consistent with my approach as a civil libertarian to narrow and limit the application of the criminal law. All right, let's talk about the two areas that uh, Giuliani wants to avoid for the president, and that's why Trump fired James Comey and what Trump might have said to Comey about going easy on Michael mm -hmm. Flynn. Uh, Rudy Giuliani kind of downplayed those on Hannity last night, saying, you know, these are just two small areas where we, uh, we really don't want special counsel to tread. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that fair to avoid? Yes, and I think they will win if that case comes to court. I don't think the Constitution permits the prosecutor to question a president when he has acted within his constitutional authority under Article 2. I think the most vulnerable question, though, for the president is one that hasn't been mentioned, and that is, did you know about the meeting in the Trump Tower before you were elected president? That, it seems to me, the president probably can't claim executive privilege over. And if he answers it truthfully, that he didn't know, because that's what he said, mm -hmm. remember there's a witness out there, Michael Cohen, who said he did know. So the prosecutor then has a basis, it wouldn't be fair, but he has a basis for charging the president with lying to the, to Mueller, and that really would be a perjury trap. So he could walk into that perjury trap by telling what he believed the truth to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's say he lays the trap, the president walks into it. What happens then? What happens well, it, as far as indicting the president? Because that doesn't seem to meet the threshold for high crimes and misdemeanors, mm -hmm. does it? No, I, I agree with you, but then he's in Clinton land. Uh, Clinton didn't meet the threshold for high crimes and misdemeanors either. What Clinton was accused of was a low crime, nothing to do with really how he administers the presidency. And I don't think this would be a high crime uh, either. But 
there is the possibility that he could write a report saying the president has committed a crime, citing the testimony or at least the public statements by Michael Cohn that contradicts it. Remember, too, a president can be indicted for any crime once he leaves office. If the election of 2020 results in a Democratic president, President Trump, Mr. Trump, former President Trump, could be indicted and it would be within the statute of limitations. So he has to be very careful. And any good lawyer worth his or her salt would recommend against him testifying or even sitting down with Mueller. In 53 years of practicing criminal law, mm -hmm. I have never had a client sit down with a prosecutor. Prosecutors are not there to help you. They're there to trap you. And every criminal defense lawyer knows that. Well, unless you're Hillary Clinton going and uh, talking with the FBI. That seems like, you know, the, the contrast is pretty stark because that seemed like a very hospitable environment. And, you know, I, I think sort of naively the president's first legal team was so acquiescent to special counsel because they thought they could uh, generate some goodwill and have the president mm -hmm. walk into that same kind mm -hmm. of environment. I don't think that's going to happen here. No, and I think he ought to make one phone call to Martha Stewart and ask her her advice as to whether you should sit down and talk to a prosecutor. Mm -hmm. Martha Stewart's lawyers walked her into the prosecutor's office. She ended up being indicted not for what she allegedly did on the tarmac and inside the trading, but for misleading and saying state making statements to the prosecutors which the prosecutors believed to be untrue. Yeah, so it's always a non-starter to start sitting down with prosecutors. You're not going to talk them out of anything. They're just sitting there waiting for you to fall into that trap. That's and true, it, it, but it's, it's also tough that. because I know that, that you are an attorney and, as you say, a civil libertarian, but there is also the political side. So, you know, looking at it from Rudy Giuliani's side, he's half politician. How do you play to your political strengths and get the most out of it for the midterms in the 2020 campaign? Well, I think Giuliani's doing exactly the right thing from his point of view. Look, I'm a liberal Democrat. I'm hoping the Democrats take over the House. I'd love to see them take <laughs> over the Senate. But I think from his point of view, he's smart because he's giving President Trump the option of then going on television and saying to the American public, I was willing to talk. I have nothing to hide. I'm mm -hmm. completely innocent. Yeah. It was Mueller who wouldn't give me an opportunity to talk. So that's a win-win for the Trump team. Ah, but he's got some he's got some bad cops now to his good cop. We'll see how it all plays out. Alan yep. Dershowitz, thank you so much. Thank you. Now, of course, what would a news day be without a presidential tweet on the Mueller investigation? And today, the president gave us a whopper, reminding us who the scoundrels really are, tweeting, this is an illegally brought rigged witch hunt run by people who are totally corrupt and or conflicted. And it was started and paid for by Hillary Clinton and the Democrats' phony dossier, FISA disgrace, and so many lying and dishonest people already fired. 17 angry Dems? Stay tuned. Should the president stay on the offensive or be a little bit more low-key as we've been promised? Let's go to tonight's panel from townhall.com where she serves as editor, also a Fox News contributor. Katie Pavlich is here along with her co-worker from townhall.com where he's a political editor and co-host of Benson and Harf on Fox News Radio, Guy Benson, and Reason Magazine editor at large and fifth column podcast host, Matt Welch is here. Welcome, everyone. Hi, Thanks hey. for having us. Hi. This is, uh, this is such an exquisite smart panel. Uh, we, we have to save plenty of time and, of course, get right into it. So uh, what, I what is the president doing right here and what is he blowing? I don't know what he's blowing per se. I think that uh, uh, Alan Dershowitz is right. A lot of this is happening in the public arena. And, in fact, it's sort of one-sided, right? It's all Giuliani. It's the president. Mueller doesn't have a really big public face here. And they're, but they're both engaged in a public negotiation. Because think about it. What is, the, what is the moment that people don't really want to see? They don't want to see, does a subpoena request go to the Supreme Court? Yeah. This is the place where constitutional crisis lives. You kind of don't want to do that. So they're both dancing around each other, trying to figure out, is there ever going to be a negotiated it's, it's, it's interview? Really and interesting. politics is part of that. Yeah, but, I mean, we have been brought to the brink of constitutional Institutional crises several times in this modern era. You know, first with Richard Nixon, and uh, again with Bill Clinton, and then with the 2000 presidential election, and now here. So, you know, what would happen if there were, in fact, a subpoena issued and it went to the Supreme Court? Is that why Brett Kavanaugh yeah. is, is such an attractive choice to the president because he's talked so much about executive deference? I don't think so, because I don't think we're going to get to that point. We might, and our institutions will be again tested, and I think they would again endure if it got all the way to that point. I just think, for now, what Giuliani appears to be doing is exactly what we heard from Professor Dershowitz there, which is 
they want to optically look open to cooperating. Mm -hmm. I think President Trump, in his gut, would love to talk to Bob Mueller because he thinks that he is not guilty of the central charge of collusion, and he wants to sort of show the world, if, I'm yeah, not afraid of this guy. Right. And I think if it were a one-question interview that were televised, and Bob Mueller said, are you guilty of collusion? And the president could just respond to that emphatically. Right. 20 he, minutes he, later, he'd be talking about his electoral college <laughs> uh, yes. total. Yeah. But, Big but right, yes. he'd, be, yes. he'd be all over it, just cutting back to Bob Mueller's stone-faced the <laughs> and entire all the, time. The mean, angry Democrats as but, well. <laughs> but I do agree all 17. They're all yes, very all angry. But I think Dershowitz is right. What Rudy and company are trying to do is seeming like the reasonable ones. We're willing, with a few exceptions, to do this thing. And if they say no, hey, we tried, but we're at an impasse. It's their fault. But we're not, we're not afraid of anything. Except but it's it's really, I want to I bring Katie in here because it's really interesting because it is a PR battle, but you're of only course. hearing from one side. Right. You know, could you imagine if Floyd Mayweather and Manny Pacquiao were, were going to fight and Manny Pacquiao didn't say a thing right. uh, leading up <laughs> to fight week? Uh, and that's essentially what it is because the president and his team, they've been very vocal. Yeah. And, you know, they are certainly maneuvering and posturing the thing. We've given millions of pages of documents. They've interviewed so many people, whatever they've laid out, we've given them. Uh, so how does the Mueller team counter that? Well, the White House has certainly taken that to their advantage because they know, based on legal professionalism, the Mueller team is not going to comment or respond to all of the attacks that are mm -hmm. happening on the attorneys that are working on the special counsel or on Robert Mueller himself. Their strategy is to stay focused, to be professional, so that when they do go into a court of law or issue any kind of indictment, whether it has nothing to do with the collusion aspect of it or not, that they have credibility as legal professionals instead of getting buried in the politics, which they're already being accused of based mm -hmm. on their ties to the Clinton campaign, the Clinton victory party on election night. But if you look at the strategy, too, coming from the White House, Giuliani is out there saying one thing on this side and one thing on the other side. And I think he's out there, too, to confuse people because special counsel can't respond. And if you look at what they're saying, the president will not answer. Mm -hmm. It comes down to the constitutionality of what his job is as president. You're not going to ask about why he fired James Comey. He has the presidential authority to fire James Comey. You're also not going to ask about private conversations, a.k.a. executive privilege, between the president and other members of, of his cabinet or his staff on Michael Flynn. So those come down to issues of what the president's it's, job yes, is. Yes, but it, it almost looks like, uh, I understand that, and, and you make a great case for that, but it looks to, you know, especially independents on the outside, that they've got something to hide. Here's the problem. You're, they're trying to appear to seem reasonable, and then it's witch hunts and uranium one and God knows what else. That yeah. doesn't look like a reasonable thing to anybody except for Republicans or supporters of Donald Trump. And here's where that comes into a problem. There's an election in November. The political climate in which a lot of this is going to play out is going to change. The calculus is going to change. Control of Capitol Hill might change in November. And then that becomes more of a millstone as opposed to something that they can yeah. play successfully. Now, uh, we, we kind of know what the parameters are of this investigation, but I think there are areas where they're so broad. And, you know, that's the thing. Like, you know there's a, a shark swimming around somewhere. Right. But it's pitch black. And we don't know how it really began, which I think is a very important, relevant question that we've speculated about. And the Trump team says it's illegitimate. Other people, including some Republicans, say, no, it's completely legitimate. But those of us who haven't seen all of the unredacted information, you know, we're just guessing here. I think another point that, uh, to your question that Dershowitz made, was sort of about the tricky terrain yeah. for Trump being that meeting at Trump Tower. And that's why I was just maybe not flabbergasted because this is how he rolls, but the fact that the president was tweeting last week with a new explanation of what that meeting was about mm -hmm. back during the campaign, it's like that is the one thing you should absolutely not be tweeting about, especially if it's not just a tweet reiterating your official story as yeah. opposed to changing the official no, story. No, it, it, but it's it's really interesting because so many people who want to bring down the president, they say, ha, this is it, Stormy Daniels, you know, <laughs> this is it. Uh, the chapter. The yeah. Wolf book, like, you know, Michael Wolf, like, this is it, fire and fury, this is going to end his yeah. presidency. No, it's whack-a-mole. I just He's think like, there's a lot, as you said, that we just don't know. And yes. the special counsel has been very quiet, but the one thing that they have come out and publicly said is that there's been a lot of misinformation in the press about what they're doing, who they're looking at. Yeah, what that kind is of the one thing they've seeking. said. So, 
you know, there is a lot of, he, he, of stuff. The only thing out. he didn't say was hashtag fake news. But, every, but he, he did not say you are very fake news on a T-shirt <laughs> that is now being, no, not sold at the news. No, I am saying it. So it. it I got anyone. Bring back the fake news <laughs> shirts. Uh, we are bringing back the panel a little bit later in the show. First up, however, Space Force. It is coming, and the Trump campaign wants you to help pick the new logo. Fantastic choices. We'll show you all of them after the break. Plus, the Republican Party barely squeaking out some wins Tuesday night. How can they turn things around ahead of the midterms? Dan Henninger joins me to discuss next. Space Force! Sorry. Nice bit. It's a cool idea. Maybe a big waste of money. And now... It is a reality. Vice President Mike Pence today outlining plans for our nation's sixth military branch. The Veep says it's necessary to prepare us for the battlefield of the future. The heavens, he says President Trump wants it up and running by 2020. Edward Lawrence live in Washington with the latest. Edward. Oh, well, Kennedy Space Force, yeah, it's still fun to say. Now, the vice president saying that this new branch of military will have a sizable budget. The administration hopes they have the statutes passed by Congress to get this branch up and running by the end of next year. And that new defense budget included new resources for two cutting-edge military communication satellites and nearly a billion dollars for our space defense programs. And today, we renew the president's call on the Congress of the United States to invest an additional $8 billion in our space security systems over the next five years. Uh, the Vice President is saying that this branch is necessary to strengthen our security, ensure prosperity, and carry American ideals into the expanse of space. Defense Secretary Jim Mattis says that he's on board with creating the sixth branch of the military. The U.S. has already had a foothold in space through NASA, something not lost on this administration. Now, to be clear, the Space Force will not be built from scratch because the men and women who run and protect our nation's space programs today are already the best in the world. And since the dawn of the space age, America has remained the best in space. Now, in the Department of Defense report creating this branch, it specifically calls out China and Russia, saying those strategic competitors are already pushing space warfare capabilities to neutralize our technology. The president wants Congress to start acting on this with his next budget in February. Kennedy? The Trump campaign, Edward, sent out uh, a bunch of logos asking for us to choose one. So uh, what do they look like? Well, and, and it's first important to point out that this is from the, the campaign to reelect the president in 2020, not from the official White House. These are not official logos, but you can see a number of them very uh, jovial uh, is the only best way I can describe it. And, and if you ask me personally, though, they kind of look like they belong in a Buzz, year, buzz Lightyear package. Uh, but you can see the, they're there for you to vote on. They would like to find out which one, or this campaign would like to find out which one America is thinking would be the best logo. Which Again, one's your favorite, not Edward? official. Not official official what do you like? so uh you yeah so they um they, they will not be on side of any which planes one do you or, like? or space which one look go. well which one do i like i like um i gotta be honest with you my vote would go to the um the united federations of planets logo i i, I don't like uh any of these <laughs> <laughs> i have a rocket from the crypt tattoo on my angle i like that a lot better <laughs> edward lawrence live in dc thank you so much we're great uh, this week's crazy elections, they're still not over. Can you believe it? We still don't have a winner in Ohio. And the governor's race in Kansas, now it's just down to 91 votes between the two candidates. Chris Kobach hanging on to his razor-thin lead over Governor Jeff Collier in that Republican primary, and it keeps shrinking. Of course, Kobach was endorsed by President Trump. Combine that with the slim lead Republicans have in Ohio's 12th district, and many Republican candidates are asking themselves an important question. Hitch their trailer to President Trump or go their own way. Let me ask Wall Street Journal deputy editorial page editor and Fox News contributor Dan Henninger is here. Welcome back, Dan. Good to be with you. Uh, so let's discuss this a little bit. I, I think it's very interesting that, you know, obviously some people really love the president, some people really hate the president. It's the ones in between who seem to be deciding these elections. So how are candidates going to use his wattage in the midterms? Well, I think, you know, the record shows that if you are running in a district, well, the record, I was going to say the record shows if you're going to run in a district that was carried overwhelmingly by Donald Trump, you want him to come in and campaign for you. That said, 
Kathy McMorris Rogers mm -hmm. running in eastern Washington state from a district that Trump carried by 12 points, could not get her vote above 50 percent in that jungle primary. This is a well-known Republican member of Congress. Yes, Ohio member of leadership. Ohio 12, there probably is, you'd be hard put to find another district more heavily weighted towards the Republicans mm -hmm. than Ohio 12 around Columbus. And Troy Balderson finishes in a virtual dead heat, mm -hmm. even after the president was there the previous weekend campaigning for him. So the question is, is Trump driving votes towards these candidates or is he siphoning them away from these candidates? And, and well, you inject a, another element here, and that's fair-weather Trumpers. These yeah. are not never-Trumpers. Who are these people and, and what effect are they having on the polls? I think you're seeing the development of fair-weather Trumpers. And these are individuals, say, who live in the suburbs around Columbus who like Trump's policies. Mm -hmm. They like things like the tax cut. They like the strong economy but they really don't care for the president's personality. He rubs them the wrong way. He rubs some people the wrong way. And it's fine for him. It works for him. He's got 35% of the electric vote you know, locked up. Yep. They'll never desert him. But if you're Troy Balderson, it may not work so well if some of these fair-weather Trumpians are pulling back during these elections. Yes, you're saying that they're not going to show up to vote. They're not passionate enough about anything, and, and they are not passionate about... The president's personality and therefore could be a liability? Well, it could be a liability. I think it may well be a liability, but <clears throat> let's keep in mind this is August, it's not November. Yep. You've got several months to try to convince these Republicans to recognize what the stakes are. You're staring down <clears throat> the barrel of Nancy Pelosi's speakership yes. and an impeachment circus. Now, we just had a huge GDP growth quarter. Are we going to see that again because you're going to have one more full quarter before the midterms? I, well, the economists that are being polled by the Wall Street Journal are looking at 3% growth uh, for all of 2018. Uh -huh. And the economy's booming. I mean, the story's just one after another. Capital investment, we can't find enough workers in the United mm -hmm. States. That should appeal to most voters. But I think these Republican candidates are going to have to get out there and drive that idea. The economic message? Yeah, because the whole Trump, it works for Donald Trump. There is no question about it. But for these other candidates, they just can't do Trump. Yep, my monologue is next. Stay right here. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is like the jelly of the month club. Her interviews are the gift that keeps on giving the whole year. Last night, she clarified where all the great savings will come from in her recession-inducing Medicare for All plan. No more funerals. So we're paying for this system. We Americans have the sticker shock of health care as it is. And what we're also not talking about is why aren't we incorporating the cost of all the funeral expenses of those who die because they can't afford access to health care. That is part of the cost of our system. Huh? What? What? <laughs> so Messiah Bernie is going to keep people from dying because people only die as a result of private health care systems. So Canadians are immortal? Got it. It's great news for Terrence and Philip. Facts are never a problem for Miss Ocasio-Cortez because she doesn't bother to learn them. People will still die when Bernie's president and every sector of the economy is made public. And there is no guarantee people will live longer or better because of anything in this utopian stomach churner. What is proposed is a 40% pay cut for doctors and providers and somehow That'll pass the savings on to you. If you like your doctor, you won't be able to keep your doctor because your doctor won't be a doctor anymore if her pay is cut so drastically. Would you stay in your thankless government-run, bureaucratically hobbled job if you had to take that much of a bath, doing twice the work for less money? Oh, hail to the no! And nor should you. The numbers don't add up for this pie-in-the-sky gobbledygook. Voters may be confused about the future of health care thanks to both flaccid parties. But this electile dysfunction won't be cured by the little blue pill of democratic socialism that can't provide basic answers to critical questions like, how do you pay for it? Not enough people are dying to find out. And that's the memo. <laughs> Tom Perez, the chairman of the DNC, has said that Ocasio-Cortez is the future of the Democratic Party. Goodness, I hope so. She sure is entertaining. But that was before her string of gaffes. So should the left 
perhaps rethink where they're going. The panel is back. Katie Pavlich, Guy Benson, and Matt Welch. Um, I think that this young woman is a gift. I think that uh, she, she, she really is fantastic because she doesn't put herself in a position where she's truly challenged. Even Margaret Hoover, who got the best of her about uh, Jerusalem and Israel, right. mm -hmm. just by asking her simply, can you please clarify? Uh, she was completely undone in that interview, but I agree with Ben Shapiro. I would like to see her. I would challenge. love to see Ben Shapiro debate her. That yes. would be amazing. Let's just say she's not Barack Obama, okay? She doesn't have any of the charisma, even if she's peddling something that she doesn't necessarily back up with any kind of plan at all. She's not good at actually trying to sell it. I want to talk about her comments with the funerals, okay? Mm -hmm. Exactly the opposite actually happens. When she, she wants to talk about the cost of funerals, in Great Britain, hundreds of people die every single month as a result of a nationalized health care system there, prompting more funerals. And so if we want to talk about uh, that, that is the issue. When it comes to her moving forward, I think Democrats are frantically trying to get her off of the global international national stage because mm -hmm. all of the moderates who are running in districts that Trump won are dying to get away from the question of whether they support socialism that the media has propped up as what the Democrats want to do as a result of her win in a yep. very liberal and district you, in New York. You have publications like Vox saying that her plan is untenable. It's her plan, it's Bernie Sanders' plan, and you know, I know she had a big victory over an establishment Democrat, and there was a very exciting moment that many were hoping was pivotal, but there's something missing here. Knowledge. Um, so, <laughs> I, I, watched, about things. I watched the funeral thing, Yeah. and it took me a few reruns to make sure like she was actually advancing this argument, and I just wanted, I guess it was CNN, but if it had happened on our network, mm -hmm. I just wanted like a Fox News alert to swoop in, whoosh, bong, bong. everyone dies. <laughs> yeah. like, We're that all is, dying. We're that dying is right now. a fact <laughs> of life, period. Well, why are we working those costs in, too? I mean, it's, it's just, ultimate, it yeah. really, it's just like, oh man. And I do think that if she were a conservative woman with this exact skill set and degree of knowledge, she would be an object of universal ridicule. Yep. But she Answering is on the right team. Answering questions like a concussed teen <laughs> beauty pageant contestant. When's the last such time? As, such as the Iraq. <laughs> when is the last time Democrats had someone under the age of 75 that was quickening people's pulse? That's a, that's a that's part of it here. I mean, you go to the Democratic conventions every four years with me, uh, and uh, man, it's sad. They'll they'll, they'll try out. You know, uh, uh, some rando from San Antonio, that's the best that they, they got. They don't really have young talent. So, of course, they're falling over themselves for it. But it also shows, I think, that um, it, Bernie Sanders has really taken the party. He's crystallized a sense there, an untethering from kind of any kind of sense of realistic policy. Mm -hmm. Bill Clinton at the 2012 uh, Democratic Convention had a great line. But the problem with the Republican economics is math, mm -hmm. right? Which he then followed up saying, we've got to take care of our debt or it's going to take care of us, and which he's totally right. Yep. Democrats have stopped talking about that. They've stopped even trying to get this stuff to add up. Hillary Clinton criticized Bernie Sanders for having his Medicare for all not ha adding up. And then by the end of the campaign, she was adopting a lot of that same language. Democrats have just moved over into fantasy land on economics. So she's the poster child for that. But, but it's going to be Ocasio-Cortez dismisses the Mercatus Center study as saying it, you can't, you know, this is illegitimate because the Cokes paid for it, which, first of all, isn't true. And second of all, you know, as I said, Vox and the Urban Institute came up with the exact same numbers. So they don't want to talk about the reality of what this would cost the country and they also don't want to talk about the detrimental kind of care that patients would get so it's one thing to talk about the, the numbers and the debt and that is very important but they are acting as if you implement a single-payer nationalistic health care system that you are going to a have more access to care and access to better care and we have seen it's not just about studies we have seen evidence in other countries around the world whether it's well, Cuba the Venezuela VA. the Canada I mean, the these, VA these, these Great Britain that the it doesn't, it doesn't work Vermont, Vermont. Right. Right. It doesn't it's work. Right. yeah they I mean in Bernie Sanders Vermont, they couldn't afford uh, the program. That was only four billion. And you know, in California, it's four hundred billion. In Colorado, it's twenty-five billion. They cannot make it work, and that's why you know it, it gets caught up in legislatures or voters, like in Colorado, saying, Pfft. "Well, speaking of that noise, Ocasio Cortez <laughs> appears in a new film by her extremely wealthy socialist friend, Michael Moore." The trailer for Fahrenheit 11.9, so clever, came out today. It looks like a beaut. How the f*** did this happen? The American dream is dead.
stop resisting. The president's powers here are beyond question. Ladies and gentlemen, the last president of the United States. Oh my gosh, that's so deep. More said he hopes this documentary shows people the grave danger of Trump's presidency, but will this latest project flop as hard as his Broadway show? Matt? No. Dinesh D'Souza's documentaries do really well. Michael Moore's uh, do really well. We're in the era of not just comfort comedy, which we see all over the place, but comfort documentaries. And at some point, we all should step back and say, are we being grifted? Here, this kind of political, like, uh, chum bait out there that, that, that's being uh, served. There's a lot of people who are just making money by uh, tweaking the levers of people's political passions and hatreds. He's one of them, and he's not even doing it. He should have called it the last president. That's at least not repeating a title that he's already done before. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it can't be a grift if the marks really want it. Right? Like, it's, they're not being fooled. They want this. That's true. And so they're like, hey, yeah, let me shell over 20 bucks to see this nonsense film. I mean, part of Trump's superpower is that he creates lunacy among the people who oppose him. So does this just buy into that lunacy? Yes. When you were saying this is the last president, like, he's going to, this is always the fever dream of every crazy partisan that elections will be canceled in the next election because of the evil people who are currently in power. Yep. Flight 93, baby. Like, come on, man. It's We're going to have another president one day. Yep. He will be or she will be elected properly. And this only serves to, I think, help Trump Meathead, and also... Meathead Rob Reiner yes. uh, said that the midterms are the most midterms. Yeah. Not 2020, not 2016. <laughs> the midterms, the 2018 midterms will be the most important election of his lifetime. Yeah, maybe not. I don't, I don't think that's probably true. I also want to say that I think we've seen enough of Michael Moore on camera. Mm -hmm. I'm done seeing him on camera. He should thank the president for keeping him employed. Yep. If his goal is to show the grave danger of Donald Trump, it's a repeated argument. It's nothing new. It's not creative. We've been hearing this hysteria for two years. Three Michael years. Moore, by the way, was the one who called his election. He said right. there's so many voters who were underserved. These people are going to vote for him. Mark my words. And boy, was he right. Thank you so much. Matt, thank Guy, you. and Katie. Brilliance personified. Uh, well, the city of Chicago is in crisis. A dozen dead this last weekend. Hundreds killed this year. President Trump says poor leadership is to blame. Is it finally time to give Rahm Emanuel the boot? Listen up, Chicagoans and beyond. Lawrence Jones is next. Chicago has a crisis on its hands, and now angry residents are calling on Mayor Rahm Emanuel to provide concrete plans to stop the violence or get the hell out of office. How bad is it? This past weekend alone, 12 people died, 70 others wounded. So far this year, more than 1,600 people have been shot. The percentage of those uh, that are solved in the single digits. So what is the solution? Let me bring in Campus Reform Editor-in-Chief Lawrence Jones. Welcome back, Lawrence. Hey, my friend. So you are from a part of the country where there are a lot of guns, but people aren't killing each other like they are in Chicago. What is going on in Chicago that is causing so much carnage? Well, yeah, part of it is the, the, you know, the gun laws there. Part of it is there is so much poverty and gang violence there. Part of it is there is a lack of leadership, and somehow people think sending the federal government in is somehow going to improve the relationships uh, in those communities. At the end of the day, Rahm Emanuel and the city council need to do their jobs or just leave. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's a matter of them getting involved with the community. I don't understand how these people continue to get elected, Kennedy. Now, is there a disconnect between uh, Chicago PD and some of the communities that they police. I'm not blaming this on the cops, but one of the solutions that Rahm Emanuel is posing is bringing in an extra 600 this weekend. Yeah, I, I think enforcement uh, is part of the problem. But remember, th there's been some other issues within the, the you know, I'm not going to pretend like there hasn't been corruption in the Chicago Police Department. Now, that's mm -hmm. not a, an indictment on all officers, but there there has been corruption. There is a poor relationship between the community. There is a no snitch policy that results into a lot of young people that look like me dying in the community because mm -hmm. there, there isn't that relationship. I'm not sure people keep saying turn to the faith-based leaders, but 
they they have been silent on this issue. There's been a few. Um, at the end of the day, the officers need to be embedded within the community. They need to be attending events. They shouldn't be just showing up when there is a crime. Mm -hmm. They need to be there before a, cr a crime is ever committed. Yeah, and and you know people need to have honest conversations about the sanctity of life, but also we have to figure out if how much prohibition is causing and exacerbating this. That's because, exactly. you know, when you have gangs, yeah. gangs spring from something. Right. And, and that's... And that's exactly right. And, and it's the poverty. It's the hopelessness in the community. And that's why I, I think those proposing, and I, with all due respect, there's a lot of people that are on the right that are proposing sending the National Guard. That's a shortcut to doing this. And there is no shortcut to improving a relationship. It also and doesn't, our poverty it, it doesn't address the causes. Like it, exactly. it really doesn't address the problems. And I think, you know, and I talked about this a little bit on Outnumbered today, when you have prohibition of guns and drugs and you have a, a state and a city that are run by corrupt unions uh, and you've got people who are leaving in droves, you've got uh, a recipe for Detroit. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a trash fire there, Kennedy. And, uh, and until they improve the community um, at large, not yeah. just the policing issue and not just the gun violence issue, they have to tackle the heart of the problem. And then you'll see that community improve. Lawrence Jones, thanks so much. Thanks, my friend. We'll be right back. The Department of Homeland Security busted five people this week who were trafficking $73 million worth of counterfeit Air Jordans. The Internet is furious, but you shouldn't judge these folks until you've walked a mile in their shoes. hey -oh, Lace them up, because this is a topical storm. Topic number one. We begin tonight in the fun house that is Florida, where even the bears are now getting trashed. Look at this. This little fella broke into the garage of a local TV host and stole her trash. It's a crazy story, but if you Google TV host and trash, huh, every story is about Samantha B. Weird. <laughs> I'm kidding. But this guy isn't. He broke through a bear-proof garbage can, smashed the lock, and ran off to the woods where there was nobody to take it from him but Hillary Clinton. The bear has not been spotted since. And police say it's a miracle. No one got bit, even uh, given the amount of face-eating zombies there are in Florida. <laughs> Topic number two. <laughs> Barely made it. <laughs> Chicago may be the second city, but they're about to get the first piece of the pie. Of course, I'm talking about the first ever United States Pizza Museum. That's good news for Chicago. It opens tomorrow. New Yorkers are furious with the location and claim they got robbed. But if we're being honest, completely honest, no one's been robbed more than Chicago's pizza delivery guys. The 3,000 square foot museum features pizza memorabilia like boxes, menus, and toys. Oh, boy. They'll also have items from foods like pizza, like Little Caesars. If you plan on going... You should know that there's no restaurant on the premises because it's not like people would be hungry after looking at a mile of pizza, dum-dums. Don't forget to visit their gift shop where they have dozens of Playboy magazines that only contain the articles. <laughs> Big teases. The Internet is fiercely divided over which city should host that museum, New York or Chicago. And while we're unlikely to solve that now, I think we can all agree that anyone who refers to pizza as za is an unbearable jackass. <laughs> and it belongs in New York. Topic number three. Speaking of burgers, the Arizona Cardinals are selling a seven-pound hamburger this year. Now, sure, the Cards have never won a Super Bowl, but who needs heart-stopping plays when you've got heart-stopping food? This culinary cry for help is called the Gridiron Burger. What? It contains one pound of beef patties, five hot dogs, five bratwursts, and 20 slices of cheese. Because let's face it, anyone can kneel for the national anthem, but it takes a real hero to kneel for the whole game. Somebody help me up! The burger also includes eight pieces of bacon, eight pieces of chicken, 12 ounces of fries, and a partridge and a pear tree, which is crispy and delicious. Estimates put the burger at 8,600 calories and 805 grams of fat. Not that it matters, because if you really cared about your well-being, you wouldn't be rooting for the Cardinals in the first place, except for Josh Rosen. I do have a soft spot for him. The Gridiron Burger, 75 bucks. But if you finish one, they'll give you a free T-shirt to wear in the pool over here. Yep, topic number four. 
We do a lot of stupid criminal stories in this segment, but this next fella's a real dummy. Police in Lone Peak, Utah apprehended this guy after a group of pranksters left him in the road to scare drivers. We can't confirm the identities of the pranksters because they're underage, but we can tell you that this guy hasn't been bailed out yet. Surprising, because from what I hear, his wife is an absolute doll. Utah police shared the photo to warn against the dangers of pranks like this. And while it is an odd story, it's nice to see a dummy making headlines. Besides Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. What? Mm. Topic number five. They say a broken clock is right twice a day. Ah! Which is two more than the jerks who write to the show. And then there's you. This is viewer mail. Debbie kicks things off with, Not everyone gets your sense of humor. I know I don't. Yeah, well, you got plenty from a couple of the guys in the pipe fitters union, if you know what I'm saying, Debbie. Uh, Mike tweets, Montgomery, quit BSing us. You're not as smart as you think you are. You're now known as Scripted Monty. <laughs> I have a feeling that's from a family member. Jim writes, turned on Kennedy to watch some Led Zeppelin, had an MTV flashback, but woke up to politics. <laughs> GLB Soccer brings it home with some advice. Seek professional help. Oh, yeah? Like all the firefighters and cops who visit your mom's apartment every night? <laughs> to help her with the lost cat and stuff. We'll be right back. Thank you so much for watching the very best hour of your day. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Kennedy Nation. On Facebook, it's Kennedy FBN. Email Kennedy FBN at foxbusiness.com. And I want to say a very special thank you to our college associate, Kia Rice, who knocked it out of the park. Uh, she was a delight, such a hard worker, and just shows that dreams can come true. You can work on this show. She's the only one who did. Have a beautiful night. I'll see you soon.